Hello there and welcome to Monday's Politics at Jack and Sam's Daily, your digest of everything coming up in the day ahead in British politics in under 20 minutes, available from 7.30 each day. My name is Jack Blanchard of Politico. With me, as you can hear, is Sam Coates of Sky News. It is Monday, October the 7th. It is the first day back for Parliament after conference season. And Keir Starmer, as you might have heard, has rebooted his Downing Street operation. The main focus of Government Day is rather more sombre. It's the first anniversary of the October 7th attacks by Hamas on Israel. Uh, And that will... I think, uh, follow us all the way through the day. The Prime Minister's been talking overnight about how that was the darkest day in Jewish history since the Holocaust. Uh, You've got ministers fanning out David Lammy, the Foreign Secretary, visiting a synagogue, then signing a book of condolence with Angela Rayner, Bridget Phillipson uh, visiting a Jewish school. So I think that uh, leaves a cloud hanging over uh, everything else we talk about today. That's right. We've got John Healy, the Defence Secretary, out and about on the media this morning, and I'm expecting to see Keir Starmer in the Commons this afternoon making a, a statement uh, to MPs about his recent trips abroad, where, of course, the Middle East has dominated uh, things. That we've had missiles falling overnight in Beirut. Sam and Whitehall is absolutely on tenterhooks watching that, seeing if this is going to escalate into an even even bigger regional conflict. Um but I think we need to focus on the machinations in Westminster, don't we, Sam? I mean, the the the, the reshuffle uh, that we saw in Downing Street yesterday is going to dominate conversations in Westminster circles, and it's going to dominate ours again today. And it matters because every time the top team changes around the Prime Minister, that changes how he governs, and that changes what happens to our country. So this isn't tittle-tattle, it matters. Um, now, as we do every week, let's just run you through the main things uh, of the week. Today, you've got the commemorations of the first anniversary. Um, I think you've got the common statement, uh, and I think those are the things that are going to dominate over in America. You've got a 60 Minutes interview with uh, Kamala Harris, uh, but that's it for today. Yeah, I also expected to see David Lammy in the Commons making a statement on the Chagos Islands. That was obviously one of the very big government announcements that we saw uh, last week while Parliament was in recess, and that is bound to be the force, cause of some uh, some heated debate in the Commons uh, this afternoon, Sam. Then tomorrow uh, we'll be talking about the Tories because Tuesday we get the, the next knockout round of the Tory leadership contest when the, the leadership candidates will go from four to three. Tory MPs will be voting on that on Tuesday afternoon. And Michael Gove, remember him? He officially becomes the editor of The Spectator on Tuesday uh, in his return to uh, <laughs> to prominent public life after departing as an MP. On Wednesday, we find out which two leadership contenders for the Tories will go through to the membership because it's the second of two days of, knockout, of the knockout rounds uh, and it's PMQs. That's right. And on Thursday, we should get the Workers' Rights Bill, um, the the big announcement that the Labour is going to be making on uh, on changes to workers' rights. They promised that within 100 days of government. That means they've got to do it this week. And Boris Johnson's book, Unleashed, is being launched at the Cheltenham Festival. What a treat to see him uh, back in public life. And Friday is the 100th day anniversary of Keir Starmer entering office. So it's a busy week, but let's start straight away uh, with what happened It turned out, Jack, that the fixer couldn't fix it. Sue Gray, possibly the most notorious, possibly the most well-known chief of staff in modern times, and that's not a good thing. Out yesterday lunchtime. Yeah, never become the story is the uh, is the first rule of being a political staffer. And the problem for Sue Gray is that she always was the story from the very moment she was hired. Um, when he, when Keir Starmer brought Sue Gray in in opposition, it looked, for most people's eyes, as a pretty astute hire because the problem that opposition parties tend to have is that they don't know the first thing about how to run things once they're in government. And of course, Sue Gray the theory went, would be able to do that because she was such a senior civil servant before that. She'd worked in Whitehall for such a long time. She was seen as one of Whitehall's great operators. And therefore, who better to bring in as your chief of staff um, as you prepare for government? Well, it didn't quite work out like that. And I think that the the thing that's so important about this big reshuffle, Sam, is it just tells you for sure, I mean, we've talked about it enough times on this podcast, but just how badly things have gone for Keir Starmer this summer. Like, when did you last see a prime minister? 
forced to reshuffle their entire top team within three months of taking power. You know, they spent such a long time preparing for power, thinking about what um, they wanted to do when they got into government, or at least they should have done. And yet it's pretty clear on this evidence that they really had no real plan when they came in. We've seen how badly things have gone for them over the last few weeks. And the fact he's had to um, he's had to shuffle aside uh, his most powerful aide and, and completely changed his Downing Street operation with various other appointments that we saw on Sunday as well. It just tells you very, very clearly and proves to everyone that things have not gone well so far. No, um, I believe Keir Starmer uh, made it clear that he wanted Sue Gray uh, out of that job on Thursday. That's certainly when the first uh, rumours started to circulate that something uh, was up. Um, at its heart... It turned out that Sue Gray wasn't doing the things that she was brought in and expected to do. So um, there we had a Whitehall veteran who sort of knew everybody, yet she was losing these massive internal Whitehall power struggles. So, for instance, she wanted one particular candidate to be the all-powerful kind of uh, main civil servant in number 10, known as the PPS. She wanted Dan Gieve, uh, a, a sort of veteran of the last um, uh, 15 years. But, you know, political aid stepped in, weren't keen on him. Uh, and that appointment fell casualty to the factual infighting that she proved to be less good at. Um, she was the veteran ethics advisor for successive governments when she was a civil servant. Yet her attitude proved probably fatal to her own career as, as chief of staff because she brought with her a view that you had to enable and help justify what ministers wanted rather than act as somebody who would block and shut down and stop people doing things. And that was a big problem and ultimately she ended up having far too few allies in number 10 you know she picked a fight over pay with all the advisors across the political advisors across Whitehall uh, and she was incredibly secretive I'm told even the sort of private office who run the Prime Minister's day uh, didn't all get access to the Prime Minister's diary just making day-to-day -day running and, and, and the functioning of number 10 so much more difficult now some of these things were spotted in opposition, which is, I think actually is why this is a judgment call around Keir Starmer. But the briefing, the public briefing, I'm told deliberately was held back until after the election, until, quote, after there were votes at stake, because there were clearly problems in opposition. And there were even mutterings at the point she was appointed. But the public briefing war was deliberately held back until after Labour had secured that landslide. But then it couldn't be stopped because of the scale of the problems that she seemed to be causing. Some of the things about the way Sue Gray was operating as Chief of Staff are remarkable, not least, and this is reported in multiple outlets today, that she was in charge of the government's grid of, of, of communications, of announcements. Now, that is something that is never <laughs> run by the Chief of Staff because the Chief of Staff is doing so many different things. And we've been sat here for weeks wondering why the government didn't seem to have a good handle on, you know, a steady stream of announcements, keeping control of the news agenda. We've talked about it before, you know, why don't they just announce something and, and like change the conversation when it's not going well for them well it turns out that sue gray was in charge of the grid rather than you know the person in charge of communications as you might have expected um, all of that is now going to change. Um, it's not just that Morgan Masweeney is the new chief of staff. That's Keir Starmer's you know, senior political advisor. They're bringing in other people as well. And, and, and um, among them, a, a very senior uh, comms advisor in James Lyons, uh, someone we both know well, Sam, because he used to be a lobby journalist back in the day. And it strikes me, James Lyons coming in as a, as a communications uh, guide and, and someone who'll be in charge of that grid of announcements suddenly brings a journalist brain into Downing Street, which is something that people have repeatedly said to me is missing. Now, I may be slightly biased about journalists. I realise we're not everyone's favourite people. But journalists do have a fair idea about how news stories gather pace and how when something like the freebie scandal is running, you need to change the conversation and, and like the ways to divert that media story from just moving and moving, and moving. And there hasn't been anyone in there with who've got you know lots of experience of lobby journalism and, and knows how to do that. And I think that kind of appointment in number 10 will ought to change the way that stories like that roll out. And, and Keir Starmer will very much be hoping that it means his new operation has got a much better handle on that sort of thing. And the government doesn't get completely distracted by these mini rows when it's supposed to be getting on with the business of governing. And it's the unnecessary internal rows that I think he will be most keen to stop because they always end up leaking out into the in, into the media. 
Um, I was told one story that went around special advisor circles about Sue Gray. Uh, at, at one point, she went around within earshot of some of the people she was talking about saying how she didn't like political couples. Now, the political industry is quite incestuous and there are several uh, couplings even in number 10 that are uh, that, you know that are uh, that, that that date back and uh, are only there because of their you know people are working for the Labour Party um, and uh, people wondered what her agenda was I, I just want to point out the most notable powerful couple uh, in government arguably is Morgan McSweeney who is married to Rachel Reeves parliamentary private secretary Imogen Walker and I think when people heard her say that they saw it as a kind of needling of the person who was perceived to be her rival and and that kind of thing I think just uh, aggravated people so um, they were also you know there was also a lot of Nick Bowles the former Tory minister who has been on a political journey uh, is a member of the Labour Party but she would summon him who she knew from her government days and he was quite in the office the whole time that aggravated people so needless political missteps I think were uh, the kind of thing he's trying he's, he's trying to get rid of do you think this new structure will work? <laughs> What a great question. I mean, it has to work from Keir Starmer's point of view. You can't become one of those prime ministers that is constantly resetting his top team. You remember what it was like with Boris Johnson. We seem to have a reset every few months and it was just indicative of someone who didn't know how to set up an effective Downing Street operation. We had we, we worked his way through, through various directors of communications and various chiefs of staff, none of whom were able to get a proper handle of things because ultimately the problem was Boris Johnson and Keir Starmer cannot get into that situation so he's made his move, he's made his decision but he can't keep doing it so this absolutely has to work and so there's an awful lot of pressure and an awful lot of focus now on Morgan McSweeney, Keir Starmer's new Chief of Staff um, and the question is like, frankly is he up to the job? I mean Morgan McSweeney has done an incredible job of of, of changing the Labour Party, he had a vision for bringing it back from the Corbyn years of getting someone like Keir Starmer into power, did it with a landslide victory. I mean, there can be few political aides who've been as effective of him um, over the past generation. But, Sam, running Downing Street as the Chief of Staff is a very, very different job to any of that. You have to understand how Whitehall works. You have to be able to move the levers of government from this weird little centre of power that you have in Number 10. And that is an un unanswered question as to whether he can do that. As I say, I... It looks to me like the sort of people he's brought in are the right sort of people that, that Labour needed in government. So that's a good start from their point of view. But it's very much an open question about, about whether Morgan McSweeney can do this job well. And Keir Starmer really, really needs it to work because, as we know, the first few months have been very rocky for Labour. We've got the budget coming up in just a few weeks now, which is going to be a massive moment. And they really can't afford to make a mess of that given how badly things have gone uh, uh, in terms of the early announcements and, and then the, the stories that we've seen running over the summer. The curiosity about appointing Morgan McSweeney as Chief of Staff is he did it before. He was Keir Starmer's first Chief of Staff when Keir Starmer first become, became head of the Labour Party in April 2020. And he vacated that post in June 2021 because it appeared he wasn't the right fit. So this is his second go at that job. Morgan Sweeney is incredibly popular and there are a lot of people loyal to him and he has a very good reputation for the political job uh, that he did. But already I'm told that the new structure of Downing Street is is trying to preempt some of the reasons why it didn't work first time round. So uh, a couple of figures have been brought in to be deputy chief of staff. Two, he's got two deputies. One is Vidya Alaksan. Uh, she's the political director or was the political director in number 10. Uh, and she will be one of the deputies. And the other is the longstanding uh, political fixer Jill Cuthbertson. Uh, who uh, spent uh, years working for uh, him and Gordon Brown and Ed Miliband. Uh, so those two people will, as, as it's put to me, uh, this that is an acknowledgement that Morgan McSweeney has got his weaknesses, so they have been brought in uh, in order to, you know, be good administrators, uh, be organised and catch things that uh, somebody with a giant political brain who is still acclimatising themselves to the Whitehall end of things uh, is, is going to do. Uh, I am told that um, this structure kind of has been tested before. 
there was a period after the previous to Sue Gray chief of staff, Sam White left, but before Sue Gray had uh, taken up the reins because she had a long, uh, long period of purda. Um, and during that period, pre Sue Gray, Morgan McSweeney was the de facto chief of staff again, supported by Jill Cuthbertson. And I, I am told by one that was the best period for Keir Starmer there ever was. And so they're hoping it lands a bit more like that than when he formally had the title the first time. The other thing to watch out for, and there's a wonderful hint of this uh, in the Times this morning, is now that Morgan McSweeney is in charge and, <laughs> and essentially helping Keir Starmer run the country, um, is he going to be happy with the current makeup of the cabinet? Now, Sue Gray was very involved in setting up the government, appointing ministers, um, heavily involved, famously involved, so that the, the, the reshuffle, or it's not really a reshuffle when you first form government, whatever it's called when you first appoint your government, took ages and that's because Sue Gray was signing off each ministerial appointment and certain people didn't get the jobs they wanted and they feel bitter and, and, and blame Sue Gray for that. Is Morgan McSweeney going to want a cabinet reshuffle? The Times quotes a friend of his who says he will certainly want one after the budget. So th those ministers who were close to Sue Gray in cabinet, and there were certainly a few of them, will suddenly be looking rather worriedly at their job titles and wondering if it's going to last. And could it be that this reshuffle in number 10 is actually the precursor to a wider cabinet reshuffle later in this year or early next year? Suddenly that sort of thing looks like it might be on the table. And I'm, I am just speculating here because once you change one part of the team then sometimes other changes can follow from that so this might not be the end of it sam and that's definitely something that uh, will have cabinet ministers rather we're looking worriedly into their conflicts this morning as they face up to the new realities of life in this government there's a definite truth that that speculation and the times may well be right but there's a definite truth that i've picked up which is that there was a perception in cabinet that sue gray was closer as you say to some cabinet ministers uh, than others uh, and was seen to take the side, rightly or wrongly, <clears throat> often of those on the soft left of the party, the sort of Angela Rayners, the Ed Millibands, uh, the Lisa Nandys. She, she was just seen as uh, a bit more of a defender, particularly of the underdog, if you can call it that, uh, or, you know, some uh, cabinet ministers who face like hostile briefings in the media against them she would step in and defend them whereas there are perhaps the more modernizing wing uh the more reforming wing who would uh watch her siding with them and you know cock one arched eyebrow uh you know there are modernizers in the cabinet who didn't feel that sue gray would necessarily leap to their side of the argument uh and um and they would they would comment on that and they'd comment on that that to me um and so this probably does mean a slight shift in 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 the power balance in in the cabinet if somebody as powerful as sue gray uh is no longer there supporting them the example that was always given was the months and months and months of battle that ed Miliband put up trying to keep the 28 billion pound uh, a year borrowing policy for green investment she kind of was seen to side with him and and give him a leg up in that fight against Rachel Reeves. That was the example of I was always given of her picking a side. That won't happen now. That's how these kind of appointments do make a difference to, to outcomes. And the final bit of intrigue around this, of course, Sam, is what happens now to Sue Gray. I think the, the expectation amongst lots of people in Westminster that she's going to get a seat in the House of Lords um, and we, we will have Baroness Gray of, of wherever um, as a sort of consolation prize, although that's not been confirmed by number 10. You can expect lots of questions about that at the lobby briefing this morning. And whether this new job that she's got as envoy for the regions and nations is a real job or something that they've just made up on the hoof on Thursday afternoon while the, while she was being shuffled out of the door? Is it Does it come with a salary? We don't know that. Um, and so there's, there's a little bit of intrigue too around what next for Sue Gray. But the truth is, once you get shuffled out of a job like that, you very quickly start to disappear from the public consciousness. And we are now living in Morgan McSweeney's world uh, for the foreseeable future. 30 seconds on the Tories. We've got the final two rounds of voting to work out who goes before the members Tuesday, Wednesday. Uh, Talking to MPs overnight, they were saying that they've had a lot of calls from Team Kemi, one of them. Uh, quote, they seemed panicked. They appear to be worrying about a clevery generic final. Uh, both generic and uh, Badenoch out in the Daily Mail this morning making their pitches. Uh, and uh, we're in, in, in for an intensive day of lobbying on that. Well, we can spend tomorrow talking about the Tories, can't we? That'll be something for everyone to look forward to on Tuesday morning. We'll better leave it there. Thanks very much for listening, everyone. We'll see you tomorrow. See you then.